Thank you for joining us for today's presentation, Cross-Cultural Collaboration and Leadership, featuring Professor Nancy Erb and Professor Anthony Normore of California State University, Dominguez Hill. While everyone gets settled in, I'd like to take this time to tell you a little, bit, a little about IGI Global. IGI Global is a leading international academic publisher of books, journals, encyclopedias, teaching cases, proceedings, and databases focusing on the areas of education, social science, library science, healthcare, business, environmental science, public administration, computer science, and engineering. Our presenter's research, along with thousands of other resources, is available in print or electronic format on our online bookstore. IGI Global is currently offering 20% off all publications purchased through the IGI Global Bookstore, as well as free lifetime electronic access with all print purchases. For more information, contact customer service at cust at igi-global.com to view more information on our presenters' titles and other reference sources on multicultural collaboration, visit our website, www.igi-global.com. Today's webinar will be recorded, and all registrants will receive a link to view the online recording. To participate in today's discussion, use the question box located on the bottom portion of your GoToWebinar control panel. We will reserve time at the end of the presentation for Q&A, but feel free to enter questions as we go along, and we will address them at the conclusion of the symposium. If you have any other questions or are experiencing any technical difficulties, you can ask me through the chat box as well. Thank you for taking the time to join us. Now I would like to introduce our featured speakers today. Nancy Erb is a professor in negotiation, conflict resolution, and peace building at California State University of Dominguez Hills and a Fulbright Distinguished Chair in American Studies. She has taught students from over 80 countries at the University of Denver, Pepperdine Strauss Institute for Dispute Resolution, Cornell School of Law, the University of California, Berkeley, and the University of Oslo International Summer School. Professor Erb is a practicing mediator, Paul Harris Fellow, and Fulbright Senior Specialist in Peace Studies and Conflict Resolution. She is currently serving as a Fulbright Specialist in Bethlehem, West Bank. Dr. Anthony H. Normore holds a Ph.D. from the University of Toronto. He is a professor of educational leadership and department chair of special education at California State University, Dominguez Hills. Tony has been a visiting professor of ethics and leadership at Seoul National University and is a visiting professor in the Department of Criminal Justice Studies at the University of Guelph Humber. He was recently appointed as Chief Leadership and Ethics Officer and the Chairman of the Criminal Justice Commission on Credible Leadership Development with the International Academy of Public Safety. At this time, I will turn the presentation over to our guest speakers. Thank you, professors, for joining us today. Thank you. Hello, this is Nancy Erb. I'm so happy you're able to join us for a few minutes today as we begin to uh, present some of the exciting insights and tools that are emerging from our current global efforts at cross-cultural collaboration and leadership. Uh, I want to say briefly before I start to introduce some of these insights and tools uh, that I would hope most of you would take the time to contact either Professor Normore or myself. I see the need for what we have at Dominguez Hills. Um, if you're not familiar with our campus, we are considered one of the most diverse, if not the most diverse, in the western United States. We have a living laboratory there. Like the number of uh, countries I've worked with, in my own profession and in my teaching, we have about 80 languages being spoken there. So we have this opportunity 
to practice what we are teaching and evaluate it in an applied practical way. That is critical uh, for learning what actually makes a difference and advances cross-cultural collaboration and leadership. As many of you are aware, anthropologists and other social scientists have attempted to study our individual cultures for lifetimes, and they are able to give us critical tips about engaging with a new culture. But they have not yet done much with studying the realities of organizations and communities today. Actual cross-cultural collaboration and leadership. What is working? What is not? And my field is similar. I'll say, I'll talk about it more in a minute. Okay, for the purposes of this webinar, we are defining culture in a very broad way. It does not include just ethnic and gender difference, but all difference protected and promoted by U.S. law. Now, we will include professional and philosophical differences because as you know in your actual work organizational experience, our professional frameworks may actually be the most difficult in terms of fostering effective cross-cultural collaboration. We are also defining collaboration in a very broad practical way and leadership. You can see the definitions here. Uh, both are focused on uh, bridging difference, working with a variety of people to, uh, for a shared goal or a common task. Now, as I mentioned earlier, what we emphasize in this collection, and actually what I emphasized in my first book with IGI, which focuses on the potential of diversity for innovation, are field-proven practices, those that are proving themselves in our day-to-day -day work. Um, I'm going to emphasize this because my emerging interdisciplinary field, negotiation conflict resolution, um, is a field where, once again, social scientists have attempted to uh, guide us. And, and sometimes they've done very well, but other times, <laughs> Our joke is they create more problems than they help because most of negotiation, effective negotiation, for example, cannot be studied in a, in a, in a laboratory of psychologists um, in a campus classroom unless it is actual applied negotiation with a, with a real world challenge and that sort of uh, case study uh, evaluative research is the focus of what's being done. So here we're going to be introducing what is actually proving itself or showing itself promising. Uh, we will talk about mediating institutions. Now mediation, most of you are aware, is when a third party <laughs> facilitates. So when an institution uh, facilitates between more than one culture, uh, let's say, for example, uh, engineers and uh, the communities they are serving. Uh, we are going to talk about uh, the, that critical role. Now, that role may be uh, international. We have laws that serve that role. We have various processes. It might be the role of education itself, which is attempting to educate about the different cultures that are working together in the world today. There are a, a, a wide variety. Um, but we will introduce this while coming back to field proven practices. And I mentioned the term born mediators because I imagine some of you are like myself and, and uh, Professor Normor. We were born into a multicultural family and community with multiple languages, uh, multiple cultures. So we have been learning intuitively how to bridge cultural difference since childhood. I have many of these students in my classes. They inherently understand uh, much that the rest of the world does not, those who have stayed in their own culture most of their life. 
lack this uh, wealth of wisdom. And we are starting to work with these born mediators to help them articulate uh, what they know so that it can benefit the rest of us. Um, so that's when I say born mediators, that's what I'm referring to. Um, of course there are pressing challenges. We could name many. In this particular collection we focus on uh, some of the challenges on the international level such as building a sustainable future together, but we also talk about organizational challenges, how cultures come together and quickly misunderstand each other, uh, start to describe each other in offensive ways, you know, everything that gets in the way of collaboration, innovation, and leadership. Fortunately, uh, this mess, this chaotic, challenging mess can also become a, a crucible for critical organizational personal transformation. We will be introducing today, I hope you have a chance to study this either in our IGI text or elsewhere because we just have a few minutes to introduce some very complex, uh, long uh, time research practices. Reflective practice is one of those. Now I'm going to assume most of you are familiar with applied research, that you have seen organizational business case studies that come from real world challenges, um, that you have used evaluative research in your organizational processes, um, perhaps in your marketing research, whatever. Applied research is real world research and I've already stressed how important it is. Reflective practice is a, uh, is a methodology that came out of Professor Normore's uh, discipline, education. And it has been adopted wholeheartedly by my own field. It is a, a practice that each professional within an organization, and actually all that would benefit the non-professional staff as well, uh, they are coached in evaluating, constantly evaluating and noticing the impact of what they are doing across a relationship uh, within a group or a team. It's just a constant evaluative is uh, how I'm communicating helping the situation or does it appear to be hurting and then doing some personal inquiry? What might be wrong here? What could I do in order to make this a more effective for cross-cultural collaboration and leadership, for example? Okay, I think I have stressed this enough. Uh, this collection and today, unfortunately, we can only introduce a couple, give you a taste of these tools. But the, this collection focuses on uh, pragmatic tools that are helping cross-cultural collaboration and leadership. Another practice that is critical, especially in my first book on diversity and innovation, this was stressed again and again. It might have been included in every single author's contribution. Learning to suspend judgment and develop an increasingly open mind to others, especially those we do not understand, we do not instinctively appreciate, it, it's critical. It's something that needs to be practiced a lifetime and without it, uh, cross-cultural collaboration and leadership that works is impossible. So the first step is what we focused on for many years in organizations. Experiential uh, learning, consciousness raising, so that your employees, your organizational stakeholders can begin to identify their bias and barriers to cross-cultural work. I do not believe in the, uh, in the old traditional shaming approach to this, there are now many ways to do this consciousness raising in uh, positive, even fun ways, and hopefully your organizations have experienced some of the many possibilities for identifying bias barriers to collaboration. 
Uh, I just have uh, a minute or so to uh, quickly uh, give you a taste of our collection before turning this over to Professor Normore. My research over the last uh, 20 years, uh, it, global research with what I mentioned, uh, students, clients, colleagues from about 80 countries, is that professionals are more likely to be the problem at the moment than actually cultures. We have learned to stay in our own professional worlds where we think alike, uh, where we value the same outcomes, where we even interpret what is happening and, and uh, frame issues in professional ways. So we have learned to operate in biased worlds, frankly. Now they have their, they have their reasons for the frames and bias, but it is, my point here is we may be the best of engineers and scientists, we may be Nobel prize-winning economists, but unless we're able to bridge difference, go outside our comfort zone, we will be challenged with cross-cultural collaboration and leadership. These are some of the other tools that our text will introduce to you. Process observation, seeking honest feedback across difference as part of reflective practice. Now those of you who are doing cross-cultural work are aware of this. There are hundreds of different ways we communicate, relate, approach problem solving, organizational relationships. There is no way that even our texts can introduce all of these. But the good news is the research is very strong. If you want innovation, if you want quality decision making, you want to even heighten your cross-cultural diversity, your cross-cultural service. Now, I don't have time to uh, talk about cultural frames, uh, but I do want to mention that when students study cross-cultural collaboration and leadership, they learn some very unique tools. One that is commonly appreciated is a search for common ground. We must meet in the middle. And, but it's not a distributive dance. It's not the negotiation compromise. Uh, what we are promoting here is a very transformative and true cross-cultural co-creation. Okay, let me uh, conclude by stressing the importance of applied research, evaluative research, and saying that if you are listening to me and saying my organization uh, needs all of this and we really are struggling with cross-cultural collaboration, I would recommend you look into some of the emerging professions who have some of the training, the education, the capacity that we are introducing to you today. Okay, I am going to turn this over to my dear colleague, Professor Normore. I look forward to your questions later on in this, in this webinar. Thank you, Nancy. Um, and let me, let me also reiterate the point that Professor Erb made about how thrilled we are to have so many people join us today. This is, this is fantastic. And it's also a, an indication of, of the number of people who are interested in learning about and engaged in cross-cultural collaboration and leadership. Uh, I'm going to take us through the uh, organizational leadership piece here in this broadcast with hopes that, of course, uh, Professor Erb or any of you can chime in at some point or maybe leave it till the very end. You'll see here uh, we have a lot of international contributors to our work. And obviously they span several continents and of course several countries as well. Uh, that too has been very intriguing for us because we see that we have lots of people in the world internationally who are engaged in similar work as we are ourselves and realize the importance of doing so. Uh, this has been an international, a cross-cultural collaborative effort to all degrees. 
which is why or why you see so many different countries represented here. Uh, interestingly enough, the contributors also come from different inter different disciplines. So we had a, a lot, a huge amount or a huge number of people from different disciplines, as you can see here. And interestingly enough, uh, in, in addition to that, what we've seen is that a lot of people define leadership in unique ways. For example, uh, many of our contributors have defined leadership, uh, you know, uh, uh, they range from things that somebody who others follow to somebody who communicates very well. Others in our group define it as more collaborative and include some team facilitation. So that, so that in and of itself uh, explains or shares with us the difference uh, in opinions and in how people look at leadership. Others, for example, define it as an ability to, in order to achieve a common goal. In other words, a leader who's able to bring together or has the skill set to bring together diverse people or diverse cultures in search of uh, ways to accomplish that one particular common goal. But for our purposes, and Professor Er mentioned this earlier, uh, we define effective leadership as a process, uh, and that process, of course, includes cultural and social influence in which many people uh, enlist the help and support of others in order to accomplish that particular goal. Um, let's, let's look at some of the evidence-based practices uh, that Professor Herb mentioned as well. And again, these are integral components uh, of the book in which we've just completed. Some authors, for example, thought or introduced pragmatic tools uh, from, the, from that emerging field of NCRP, which is Negotiation, Conflict Resolution, and Peace Building, uh, and Professor Erb's area is that. Others, of course, demonstrate this potency of leadership and as a best practice through case study and cross-cultural uh, progress processes that involve leadership. We've also seen others who recommend field-based practices from years of international collaboration with a variety of partners in uh, lots of lots of cultures and lots of countries. But some of those tools actually come from understanding, appreciating, and honoring the integrity of cultural norms and how important that is before people can really engage effectively in cross-cultural collaboration with leadership as a major piece in order to see that to be successful. Um, some of the other areas are dialogue, are, are in, involve dialoguing or having discourse uh, on this area. And we have had people who spent enormous amount of time uh, working overseas in different countries, uh, whether it's here in the Western world, in the Eastern world, or in any of our continents, and having, have learned so much about how important it is to honor that particular culture when trying to, or in efforts to really engage in understanding the importance of working across cultures. Uh, one of the other areas are some of those promising approaches that we found from our, or some of the findings from our book that emerged from the many of the chapters and, the, and the, uh, the suggestions that were made by many of the authors had to do with the promising approaches. For example, the organizational cross-cultural collaboration involves the integrative win-win. And the win-win here is where we have curiosity, compassion, and creativity guiding the collaborative efforts and also guiding the type of leadership that sponsors that sort of thing. Then we have also the effective training. And that involves, of course, effective teaching. Cross-cultural collaboration and leadership involves effective teaching, effective training, but it results in what we know as how, why it's important to have experiential learning involved. And then we have seen a lot of uh, case study collaborative curriculum where university and college professors or higher institution 
professors are encouraged to, where they, they encourage their students to explore various cultures and learn to appreciate the differences in that particular way of learning as well. Now, you'll see the, how we advocate for those effective models in cross-sectoral or cross-cultural communities, or sorry, collaboration, and why collaboration is optimal, why leadership is optimal, and when the two are combined and work together, we also see an emerging trend of effective mentoring. I want to also bring us to the leadership of disenfranchised population. Uh, Professor Erb mentioned that earlier as well, and why that in and of itself becomes very important because many people are engaged in that form of leadership or the form of leadership where populations who have been marginalized in society or living on, society, living on the margins in society for quite some time are coming to the fore so we can ensure that they're, re they're engaged in what we consider to be most effective cross-cultural -cu collaboration. So building that capacity for underserved communities, we have, for example, folks from New Zealand who work with the Mary, Mary populations uh, in, in New Zealand, the indigenous populations, and we see a lot of uh, collaboratives, national and international, uh, cross-cultural collaboratives, where the innovative and effective collaboration and leadership may, may be enough for many organizations, but those benefiting from the more contemporary global society have now begun to prioritize the service of those un of underserved communities. So the university collaboration, of course, also, uh, sorry, the leadership for disenfranchised populations also have found, or we have found, that the international collaborations have become more effective, they're, they're gaining a lot of momentum, and the trend is becoming more and more common as we reach out to see and, and learn, appreciate, honor again the integrity of what people are experiencing in the world, and not just our own. So we're, we're finding um, a little less myopic way of thinking, although we still see that there is a there is major myopia. We're seeing that people are now branching out to really appreciate and understand and willingness to learn about what others uh, have to teach. I want to bring us also to the mediating institutions and what that looks like, what it, what it, what it means. For example, we have uh, transnational approaches happening, and I'm going to give an example of what that would look like. We have a, a wide variety of mediating institutions, a, a wide variety of structures and processes, and these are intended to help bridge cultures and facilitate that positive collaboration, and they require inclusive leadership. For example, we take law and how law acts as a mediating institution. Uh, we see particularly with those with more power and status and how they interact with those with less power and less status. We see it also as third-party professional mediators. In our case, we've seen it with um, our architects and curators. They play mediating roles between cultures of artists and their clients. We also seen the educational organizations and how ed educational organizations mediate culturally diverse settings in academia. Uh, example, one example is we have a we have a contribution made by a diverse a group in Hong Kong and how they've studied the principalship in in school in school settings, Hong Kong principles, Singapore principles, and Australian principles. And we see how this culture of working together can mediate and influence leadership and collaboration within the same professions. For example, uh, we see principals in schools of Singapore working across culture with cultures with principals uh, in schools in Hong Kong and in schools in Australia. And we see that as a very important trend. It's beginning to take even more momentum and increase the momentum as we move forward. Now, I only have a few minutes as well, but I, like, like Professor Erb, we're certainly open to questions at the very end here. 
as we move it forward, but I want to work in or look at the critical transformation and where we are with that. I think for those of you who work with cross-cultural collaboration and leadership or in, in, uh, in, in disciplines where that is really, really uh, pushed right now, we call it contemporary globalized times. We're working, we're working in contemporary globalized times and we know the need for change at all levels. And this le these levels range from changing from the personal level it also means changing leadership from the personal level, leadership from the organizational level, uh, and leadership in general. And that's not to confuse leadership as opposed to management, because both of these, uh, while they have some overlapping components, they, are, they vary. Whereas, for example, leadership is more about influence and effectiveness, whereas management is more about processes, outcomes and tasks. That critical transformation also comes from international synergy. Uh, we have seen and we have contributions in this book as well where there is a demonstration of the importance of people from all over the world working together to create that synergy or that synergy rather to ensure that cross-cultural collaboration is in fact very much appreciated, very much engaged and embraced by people all over the world, including students, for example, who study abroad. Another contribution has to do with that. It comes from Finland. We see how students who study abroad uh, feel, and, we, and, we, and I think most of us uh, here will agree with this, how important it is to, if you want to understand what collaboration and cultures are doing, Cross-culturally, it's important to live in a culture and, and important as well to appreciate the happenings, the nuances, and the norms of that culture and respect it. Uh, the cross-cultural leadership uh, for learning is how we refer to this. We know that organizations are at a pivotal time in history and how important it is that they, they grow and they change. We want to keep up with the times. All organizations who've been, that have been part of this particular volume uh, have actually embraced this uh, quite openly, which is, and, and that's of course certainly really appreciated. They've begun to transform the traditional type of leadership as opposed, uh, you know, as opposed to, well, but they want more contemporary leadership now as opposed to that traditional leadership. An example is we see a lot of um, traditional leadership in policing and in or in criminal justice, but especially within policing agencies. And having worked with policing agencies, I've seen that myself, but I've also seen uh, more police officers and those uh, and its constituents moving gradual, gradually toward transforming and looking for other ways to ensure that policing or law enforcement itself uh, is really beginning to change. If they want to be successful, get community trust rebuilt, the public trust rebuilt. There's a way of doing that that they have not done in the past. An, ex an example would be the restorative justice techniques that a lot of police agencies in, in the Western world have already begun to embrace. For example, we're doing it in Australia. We're seeing it in the UK, in Canada, and in the United States. And we'll see some of that uh, in the book as well. And I hope that at some point uh, we might even get to a question about the restorative justice piece. So we have come to some challenges and we've, we've also come to embracing what we know as major opportunities right now. Human trafficking, for example. Um, we're seeing a lot more uh, police agencies across the world, especially here in the Western world, uh, using different techniques to combat human trafficking because it's definitely an international issue. Uh, and we see that, for example, it has, an it has increased substantially uh, for all concerned with the welfare of women, the welfare of children, and of course the poorest who are in the least powerful members of society for basic human dignity purposes. We see this more and more as initiatives to combat across cultures 
where the where worlds are now beginning to talk to each other through through law enforcement, not as much as we we want to, but we feel that we've begun to to start bridging that gap. Uh, you see that communicative intelligence as well is another is another new idea added to the emotional intelligences that we've already seen um, by Howard Gardner or Howard Gardner's work and Carl Glickman's work as well, just on the different forms of intelligences and how important it is to be able to communicate with different cultures, uh, not to impose a value or to impose a certain form of communication, but to really understand how people communicate when embracing uh, different forms of, or different kinds of culture or different cultures in general. We want to move to the, where we are and where we want to we go from here. For example, we look at moving forward and, and what that means. The global economy, for example, and I, and I believe that people here on this uh, webinar will agree it just simply demands effective cross-culture collaboration and leadership. These are contemporary times. The old or the traditional form of leadership needs to change and more contemporary leadership needs to be embraced. We also know that communication and leadership proficiency are needed in order for any of us to realize our global potential. And that potential, of course, comes from Having, having various cultures coming together in search of that common goal. And finally, my last point here would be another interesting point that was raised within our, in our volume on the importance of under, about the importance of understanding the environment, uh, climate change and, and sustainability and how these issues will help improve cross-cultural collaboration and leadership in the future. I'm going to stop at this point and pass it over to um, the, our IGI representative, Anne, and we'll take it from here. Thank you so much. This has been a fantastic opportunity for both Professor Erb and myself. So we'll now um, move on to questions, if you have some. Feel free to type in questions for our presenters today. We had a couple comments, a bunch of thank yous um, to Nancy and Tony for presenting today. Anne, I can barely hear you. If you could speak up. Absolutely. So it's really good to, to see that so many people are on here and they're involved in this. This is really, a, we're very grateful for this uh, opportunity to share our thoughts and to gather other thoughts as well. But rest assured, we've been thrilled with the, old, the whole contribution of this volume and both volumes, with Nancy's first volume and with this volume as well. You know, I, as we're waiting to hear from Anne, um, I'll just mention, I just flew back from Bethlehem, West Bank, uh, where I was doing uh, peacework uh, involving Israel and the Palestinian conflict. And I have such a sense of urgency that we come together as a community, uh, sharing our best practices and learning from our failures. I, mean, I saw, if any of you have been to Israel, have been to the Middle East, and experienced the conflict intimately, you will see uh, multiple layers of failure to collaborate. And now it's much more politically complicated than what I'm about to say, but I'm going to focus on cross-cultural collaboration and leadership. Uh, there are so many examples of organizational failure implicit in those conflicts um, 
that I, I would love to see gatherings where we simply focus on what do we need to do to move forward with cross-cultural collaboration and leadership and learn from all of your professional successes. I'm not seeing enough of it at the moment. We just had several thank yous. Um, Barbara thank you. mentioned Barbara Lee mentioned that she was um, she was there. She said it is amazing there. I know I was detained at Machine Gunpoint. Pretty intense. Well, I would hope you each will be in touch with us. Uh, our contact information is available with IGI as well so that we can continue this important conversation. I agree, Nancy. That will be important. So hopefully we'll have some people who will be interested in doing that. Absolutely. Um, I'll give it a minute or two, but I'll just kind of close up um, some things. The recording will be available online, and anyone who registered for the symposium will receive a link to view that so all of the professors contact information will be available there for you too so everyone will have that um, you will find our presenters titles on the screen here approaches to managing organizational diversity and innovation that's Nancy's title and then Nancy and Tony have a collaborative forthcoming title cross-cultural collaboration and leadership in modern organizations obviously what they discussed today that will be available for purchase in the IGI Global Bookstore. There's my contact information on the screen there should you need anything. Um, thank you everyone for coming. I don't believe we had any further questions come in, just more thank yous from everybody. Um, I think we'll close up. Great. Thank you, Anne. Thank you so thank much you. for attending. Thank you. Are we still on? Um, actually, let me interject quickly. Um, Gamal asked, um, I think he wanted to share, he wanted to ask if he could, I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm reading this correctly. Um, Gamal said, um, thank you. Would you agree for incorporating these, concept men these concepts mentioned in curriculum and teaching? educating learners in the phases of education? Absolutely. Absolutely. These concepts are very important to the field of education, not just the field of education, of course. And all of the concepts mentioned here are being used in several curriculum courses throughout education, but throughout other disciplines as well. These are all translatable, and anybody who's interested in teaching cross-cultural collaboration or leadership can certainly include the issues that we've raised here because many already are. Okay, yes, I would agree. And I would say since I just got back from out of the country, uh, as I travel, you know, much of the world uses a, more of a, a, a lecture test uh, memorization approach to learning. Um, those of us working in uh, global organizations appreciate that experiential learning, uh, which I have stressed here, uh, the best of what we would say in the U.S. is teaching and learning, more interactive, engaged, team-based uh, learning. That is all essential to uh, effective cross-cultural collaboration and leadership. So. I agree with Professor Normor. All of this content can be used across colleges, across disciplines to study this. But also, it starts to uh, introduce uh, how to do this in highly engaged form of teaching and learning. Gamal added, I also can decide that educators likewise can do effectively in mastering cross-cultural communication 
And then he also asked, would you send the main concepts of your work to be a data in preparing training and educational programs? Uh, I, I, Leanne, I didn't hear the last part of that question. Okay. Um, he said, would you send the main concepts of your work to be a data in preparing training and educational programs? Um, here, I would like to say, Professor Normore and I, yes, these books can be used and you will get ideas for training. Um, but we also have published other books. Professor Normore has focused quite a bit on social justice within education and uh, law enforcement approaches. I have a, a published a book which is actual curriculum uh, that can be uh, used case study simulations, lots of activities that can be used in training. Uh, so if you take a look at, at the variety that we have done, there's a great deal of material that you can adapt to many different situations. It addresses communication across culture. It addresses problem solving, conflict resolution, leadership. I mean, it's yes, we could spend hours, as you can imagine, uh, with this. I hope you'll take a look at all of it. That's, that looks like that's it for all the questions. Um, we hope to see you all attend our future symposiums. Again, if you have any questions, you can refer to the um, saved recording or the address on screen. Um, thank you again, Professor Erb and Professor Norm Normal for taking the time to participate in our webinar. Um, everyone have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.